Um, thank you very much. I'll quickly um, introduce myself. Um, I'm Daniele Procida, that's me. Um, my favorite portrait of me. As you can see, it says I am Python software. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I work at Divio, uh, a Swiss uh, Django company, uh, and um, I'm a developer of Django CMS. Um, I'm a core developer of the Django project and a member of the Django Software Foundation board. Um, you can find me in the usual places online on, as EvilDMP on IRC and GitHub and Twitter, and there's my email, email address there, so feel free to contact me about anything. So, firstly, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here, for being here to listen to me speak. Um, thank you especially to the organizers and volunteers of this conference, because if you're enjoying yourself here, it's because of uh, them. Uh, it's a, I know how much work it is to run a conference, and to run a conference of one and a half thousand or so people is a pretty big deal. Things will go wrong. If things go wrong, it's not because they didn't care or didn't think, it's just because stuff happens. So um, if you see any of the volunteers or organizers, just say to them personally, oh, thanks, by the way, I'm enjoying the conference, because I can tell you as somebody who has done this that actually it means a great deal. Um, so thank you to those uh, people who are making this, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you to those people who are making this happen. Um, and of course to the sponsors who make it happen, make it possible financially, the speakers who have put a lot of time in and all the participants who have come here to get together. Um, as I said, I uh, work on Django CMS, we're sponsoring, so um, uh, we are also very busy this week. We've got a Django CMS help desk on Thursday. Uh, we're doing a Docker workshop on uh, Friday. And uh, we're sponsoring. So um, I got it all excited um, that this is a great marketing opportunity. And the best I came up with is Django CMS, we're around your neck. <laughs> so um, I don't know, maybe Twitter will come alive with uh, uh, better. <laughs> No, I'm going to go into the office and get lots of congratulations from the team when that uh, um, makes a big splash on Twitter, because I think We're Around Your Neck actually works really well as a marketing uh, thing. So I want to talk about minds and machines and uh, Python. Um, I'll, I'll have a tiny amount of Python code in this, and it's not very impressive. Um, this is Alan Turing, the great Alan Turing, in a rare photograph of him smiling. And in his paper, com computing machinery and intelligence in 1950, he turned the question of whether machines can think onto its head. In fact, he said, the question, can machines think, is too meaningless to deserve discussion. And instead of asking whether uh, thought can occur inside a computer, he wanted us to consider whether, instead, whether a machine could, in principle, be indistinguishable from a human in those respects that allow us to say a human thinks or has intelligence. So he turned the, the, the question about machine intelligence, intelligence or upside down. And he was in, uh, um, applying insights from uh, the philosophy of mind that emerged in the early 20th century, which also moved away, uh, moved the questions of mind and intelligence away from a concern with the metaphysics of thought and the intrinsic nature of consciousness towards questions like what constitutes an interaction with intelligence or how do we recognize other minds? So in other words, he was uh, very much in line with or following the footsteps, if that's the right word, uh, of thinkers like Gilbert Ryle or Ludwig Wittgenstein who argued the search for mind was not a search into inner mysteries but a matter of recognizing what was in front of us all along. So we could say that this represents a kind of fork in the study of artificial intelligence. And Turing's argument, in a way, freed researchers from having to clamber into these kind of opaque mysteries of what goes on inside of consciousness and thought, um, and instead concentrate on producing, for example, interactions that seem like encounters with intelligence. And that's been the dominant fork, if you like, in artificial intelligence since then. And its fruits are all around us, I mean, literally in our pockets. So you've got your, your phone, you can say, you know, do I need to carry an umbrella today? Or um, 
you know, what's, what's happening, what events are on in, in Bilbao this week. And the power of machines to recognize stuff, like languages, faces, text, or road traffic, or not if you're in a Tesla sometimes, um, and to respond appropriately has suddenly taken me by surprise. Um, and I think it's taken many people by surprise just how good machines have become at doing this. And by Turing's account, I really do think that we're living at the beginning of an age of machine intelligence. But what about that other fork, that lonelier furrow, which fewer people have worked on and we hear less about, but people have been working there and have been trying to unpick these mysteries of thought itself. So Turing was a very intelligent thinker, but just because he dismissed something as too meaningless to deserve discussion doesn't necessarily mean that that is so. So here's, um, uh, here are two people who, who thought otherwise, who disagreed with Turing, Joseph Weizenbaum um, in, in computer intelligence research. She was the author of ELISA, the, the program ELISA, um, which was his attempt to demonstrate what, in a concrete way what was unsatisfactory about Turing's analysis, or the philosopher um, John Searle. So in this talk, I want to go back to that fork, because I also think that Turing's analysis, however brilliant and powerful it, it was, is um, a bit flawed and inadequate. And I think that the incredible advances of, you know, the series and the chatbots and the self-driving cars, as far as we're actually concerned with intelligence, I think those represent a dead end. So those things, like, like Turing's approach, begin from the outside. They're not really, I think, concerned with the nature of intelligence itself, but with the challenge of creating an appearance of it. What does intelligence look like? What does it feel to be in the presence of intelligence? And in narrow, limited spheres, this appearance can be extremely successful. And the more successful the appearance, the more easily we fall into using the language of intelligence around that behavior. Sometimes forgetting that, I mean, some people might actually find this contentious, but I think that we're dealing there with a simulacrum of intelligence that's really, in the case of, say, Siri, no, or, or a Tesla car, is, is no closer to consciousness than a stone. And I think the more interesting question is the neglected one that begins from the inside, that asks what lies at the heart of intelligence, how and where does consciousness arise? And as programmers, I think we have the concepts and tools to investigate this in useful and interesting ways. And I want to argue two things in this talk. Firstly, that programming concepts give us the most, that the programming concepts that give us the most interesting insights are in fact the most basic programming concepts and that we can find their counterparts in the work of artists, poets, and writers and that this helps us understand. So for this, we'll turn to the concept of poesis, a Greek word, uh, it's where the word poetry come from, and it means to make or to produce. And it doesn't mean making or, or production in the sense of manufacture. It, it, think of, of French or Italian verbs like faire or, or fare, uh, which they mean at the same time make and do. Or, or think in English about the way we would say things like uh, use making friends or, or making love. You know, that, that's the kind of making perhaps that is emerged, uh, involved in poesis. Poesis is not concerned with material or technical construction, but with rendering a transformation in the world, some, an act through which, uh, or a process through which something new is brought forth. Um, in poesis, um, something became, becomes another kind of thing altogether. A new thing emerges out of something, something that wasn't there before. So poetry can be considered a kind of poesis. And I think that programming also represents poesis. And that poets and programmers, because their work is poesis, this kind of making, can help us understand usefully some quite deep questions about ourselves and particularly about the nature of our human consciousness, our thoughts or the mind. So let's go straight into the work of programmers and artists. Um, programmers seem to be 
particularly fascinated by rule-governed gov rule play when they find it, and they respond to it strongly, especially um, in poetry and art, for example. And there are some poets and artists and writers whose work and ideas speak very strongly to programmers because of this. And I think that there's something in programming, or no, I think there's something in the way that programmers think that make them especially ready to understand and appreciate the intersection of these things, these work and ideas. So there are certain things you know when you, that a programmer is just going to get a certain idea or a certain work or something like that. I think part of the answer is that rule governed play takes place in systems, which of course programmers are also uh, very fascinated by. And three of the things that programmers love best in systems are interesting outside programming loops, self-reference, and hierarchies. Um, and these are also the things that make rule-governed play very interesting. And of course, they're also some of the most basic structures and concepts in programming itself, ones that determine the way programming works. So let's start with loops. Even the simplest loop, loop represents power. It doesn't matter how trivial it is, you can still unleash something infinite and the computer will try to uh, realize it. So there are many constructs in computing. This is kind of the most basic, but also the most beautiful and powerful. Um, I, I, love, I love loops, um, all of them. But still, the fascination of um, go to 10 is quite limited. Um, the only thing interesting about that particular loop is that it's infinite, not because of anything that comes out of it. So. Um, that's not very interesting, but when we apply loops to other things, then they get more intriguing. Does anybody know or remember the website techstark.org? Um, I used to spend a lot of time there 15 years or so ago. What it does, it loops over a text and represents it visually, and I can't show it to you on a real website because it's, it's so old that it, it's Java and, and I have to load a virtual machine running Internet Explorer to do that, so I'll just have to show. This is the text of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Okay, right round the edge, and then the words in the middle are in their place depending on where and how many times they appear around the end. So look, here's the word and therefore the character Alice in relation to the entire text or, or in relation to the story. Alice is literally at the center of the story of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Here's the griffin. As you can see, a peripheral character. Here's a linear sequence through the actual text in Text Arc. I, um, go, go and find um, Text Arc. It's, it's wonderful if you can get it working on your machine. If you can find it working on a MacBook, uh, on a Macintosh, tell me how, because I'd love to get it working again. Um, so, in text art, we no longer have a sense of the content of the work, but instead we get its structure exposed by a loop presented as metadata. And structure and metadata matter. We've lost something, the content, but we've gained something else because it lets us see new meaning that perhaps was previous, previously obscured. Um, in, in the loop of text art, we can see who is associated with whom or what. We can see who appears when and with whom. We can see who dominates the story. And when I say see, we literally, visually can see it. So don't be distracted that, you know, text arc is a nice, is, is amusing and literary. What it does is powerful and significant, a fact that's not lost on large corporations and governments who understand the power of this stuff too. Google and Facebook know all about uh, structure and metadata. And right now in various countries, governments are anxious to have legislation enacted that will help them look more closely at metadata. Of course, they'd never do anything like eavesdrop on their citizens because that would be wrong. They just want to know, you know, some of the metadata surrounding those conversations. So I'll, I don't know if you can see that from up there. So storing metadata is not an invasion of privacy. It's a tool that keeps America safe. No one is listening to your calls. So, um, Congressman, I see here last Friday you talked to your wife, then immediately called an escort service, then a hotel. Of course, we don't know the content of those calls. So, oh, that's your wife now. <laughs> so this stuff is powerful. 
Microsoft, I came across this by chance. Uh, we use the cloud to visualize information so we can track down the criminals. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> so on TechStart, the first text you get is um, Hamlet. It's not there by coincidence. Programmers and people who are doing stuff with language always go for Hamlet. Uh, sorry, uh, Alice. Or Hamlet. These are the two texts they always go for. There's something special about these two texts. Here's Hamlet. And here's Ulises Carrion. He's, uh, he was a Mexican artist. And I'm going to play you a part of his um, Hamlet for two voices. So I've got to bend this down and we don't have direct audio, so I'll just do this here. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Horatio. Marcelos. Francisco. Marcelos. Francisco. Marcelos. Bernardo. Okay, so I, I, think this is, I think this is hilarious. I think this is very funny. But I also think it's not just funny. It's a new interpretation of Hamlet. It's a Hamlet for two voices, left and right. It's the whole of Hamlet. It lasts about 15 minutes like that. <laughs> Without any content whatsoever, all we have is the structure. So what have we lost and what are we left with? Well, it's true that you won't know from this that Hamlet is about revenge or murder or desire, and you won't know that Hamlet's a prince or the story set in Denmark. But there's still a lot to learn. We know who's there at the beginning. We know who's there at the end, which is, you know, if you're there at the end in a Shakespeare tragedy, then that, that's a big deal. You know, not everybody gets to be at the end. Um, we can discover whom the story revolves around, who dominates the conversations, who hangs around with whom, who answers whom. So we've lost something. We've deliberately thrown some information away, but we've exposed perhaps some previously hidden information at the same time. Now, when I play this to other people, everyone at first says, you know, what, what is this? And then it divides the world up into programmers and non-programmers. Because non-programmers -pro non say, what's the point? And they're baffled or, or even irritated, and I've had people really annoyed by that. Um, but programmers love it. Uh, now, you may all be programmers. If you didn't love that, then m maybe you just don't have the soul of a programmer. <laughs> yeah? So, because also some people who are not programmers love that. So maybe there are non-programmers who have the soul of programmers. But anyway, the point is that programmers get this kind of thing. They understand loops, they understand what's important about metadata, and they know how to recognize a key value pair when they see one. So, you know, you show me some key value pairs, and well, I'll show you some code actually. So let me quickly jump into um, uh, here. So I've got a little program, a little Python program, okay? And it just jumps onto the internet. It uses beautiful soup. This is a very uh, useful library for exploring um, uh, structured uh, text like HTML. It loops through the text, drags things out um, in pairs, and then passes them to the say command. So I'm going to, uh, um, this is my little uh, tribute to Ulysses Carrion. So. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Horatio. Marcellus. Francisco. Marcellus. Okay, thank you. Francisco. Francisco. Okay, thank you. Francisco. That's enough of that. Okay. Um, so, computers are perfect tools for um, this kind of for the exploration, the analysis, the discovery of texts and language. And if you're interested in doing that, it's very easy and accessible stuff to do. What could you discover with a simple program, you know, like text arc or something like this? Um, could you extract the punctuation from a text, maybe, and recognize the author by the punctuation or by the white space? Um, I spent a lot of time with a Raspberry Pi and uh, a little LED, uh, a an array of LEDs visualizing the characters in Hamlet as kind of spiraling outward um, uh, different colored lights. So it, it, it's fun to do, even if you're a lousy programmer like me. There's a massive amount of, of this stuff going on in the world of literature. There's a whole field of experimental literature that analyzes text, synthesizes them, deconstructs them. There's the Ulipo, the Ouvroir de Literature 
Potentiel, the workshop of potential literature, French, mostly French, writers, mathematicians, and artists. Um, I don't really have time to talk too much about that, but um, I recommend having a look at, at that. Or, and you don't have to go to experimental literature. Here are a couple of pages from Douglas Copeland's Microsurfs, the vowels on one page and the consonants on the other. Um, and we can play endless games, fun games, illuminating games with texts like this. And I'm talking about games and playing, and some of it's fun, but it's also serious, because play doesn't just refer to having fun. Play means the looseness in a mechanical connection. You say it has a lot of play in this connection when the connection's not tight. The extent to which one side, side of a connection is free and undetermined by the other. And play is only possible where you have a linkage, where you have a connection, a constraint. If there were no constraint at all, then there would be nothing. They would, you wouldn't have any play, you'd just have no connection. Um, and on the other hand, if the connection was so tight that, that it were locked solid, there would be no play either. So you only find it where there's a connection and where the joints permit some movement. And the rules and connections in language are just open and enough uh, and open and loose enough for both rigorous meaning and play within the same system, which is quite remarkable. And this kind of play is something that's enjoyed and exploited by artists and writers and programmers. So we've seen some examples of looping in text arc and, and in Hamlet, but this kind of play becomes even more interesting when the looping becomes self-referential. So here's Ulises Carrion. Again, with his first Spanish lesson. Uh, I know some of you already know Spanish, but let, let me play you his first Spanish lesson. So this is Findish. Español. Español. Es español. Es español. Sí, es español. Es ese español. Sí, ese es español. Es ese español español. Sí, ese español es español. Es ese es español español. Sí, ese es español es español. Es si es español español. Sí, si es español es español. Es si es español español. Sí, si es español es español. Es si es español. No, si ese no es español. Es ese no es español español. Sí. No okay, so, I, um, this is language about language. This is language looping over its own structures, recursing on itself. It's language eating language. And now, again, you know, I play this to people, and I watch people get angrier and angrier <laughs> as this goes on. You know, definitely n not people with the souls of programmers. And I had one person turn on me after a few minutes and say, this is a shit way to learn Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I love this. I, look up Ulises Carrion, bless him. He, uh, he died young. Um, this is so fascinating. Now, usually when something consumes itself in this way, it reduces itself to nothingness. But in this case, Something new, something other seems to be coming out, something new and almost magical, you know, something slightly maddening about it. And it's a perfect example of playing with rules and processes. So as a programmer, uh, you know, it makes you itch a bit. Uh, in a way, this is a program that follows its own internal logic, obeys its own rules. And it makes me think, you know, could we make a first Python lesson in, in the same way? And, uh, you know, we have the technology. Um, we could get Python to consume itself and regenerate itself like this. But I got distracted by my Raspberry Pi and the colored LEDs, and so I never really got much, much further than that. But, you know, maybe somebody's a, 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 um, a better programmer and less easily, less easily distracted could uh, come and talk to me about that. So it's a kind of impossible magic when you make something eat itself, but it's a very old, a very ancient concept. So here's the Ouroboros, the, the snake that eats its own tail, and it's very important. It, it visits chemists in their dreams, as you'll know if you've studied chemistry. So Auguste uh, Kekules ha had a dream of 
the snake eating its tail and providing him with the solution to the puzzle of the, the benzene molecule after many years of studying carbon-carbon uh, bonding. And it's an ancient symbol of renewal and regeneration in, in many cultures. And programmers, as much as artists, are fascinated by what happens when a self-reflecting process uh, loops. And as programmers, we're particularly lucky because we've got the perfect tools with which to explore it. And I, was, I mentioned magic, you know, it's a kind of impossible magic, but the magic is not just that the snake bites its own tail because, you know, any idiot dog can bite its own tail and, and not produce anything uh, magical. The magic lies when something eats itself and then somehow sustains itself and then something new emerges, something that wasn't there um, before. And I think it happens in Ulises Carion. Something new comes out of the loop that wasn't in it when we started, a new thing altogether. And this is the poesis that uh, we're in search of, or maybe I'm in search of. Here's another representation of the Ouroboros, this time by the artist MC Escher, who's also fascinated by loops and self-reference. It's a woodblock print with some very interesting things going on. Uh, where does this loop begin? Um, how, oh, is, oh yes, it, it's a loop. Well, is it one loop or is it several loops? Was there a four bands going on? So maybe, is that five loops? Is it four loops? Is it one loop? Um, it's looping on different levels. You have to choose the level at which you see it looping. You have to make a decision to hold in your mind when you look at it. There's a hierarchy of looping going on. And this is where things get really interesting. Here's Douglas Hofstad, and I think he's possibly the most, one of the most interesting thinkers you could ever hope to read uh, a book by. He's interested in hierarchies, in multiple tangled hierarchies of self-referential loops. His best-known book is Gödel Escher Bach, uh, which explores art, uh, music, uh, logic, and consciousness. And it's a, a, an utterly remarkable book driven by this uh, fascination with loops and self-reflecting processes. And he's in search of the ultimate in self-reflection, which is our own human uh, self-consciousness subjectivity itself. And the book itself loops and recurses and reflects itself at different levels in its own structure. And he's interested in what could emerge from this kind of process. Um, it's a, a work, a book, whose humor and sense of aesthetics will appeal very naturally to programmers. Um, here's Hofstadter's Law. It always takes longer than you expect even when you take into account Hofstadter's law. Yeah, I see, programmers love this kind of stuff. Um, so, we've talked about emergence, where something new and unexpected comes out of a process at some other level. Hofstadter is interested in these emergent properties of systems. Um, an emergent property is one that arises in a system but can't be found in its components. So uh, sometimes the property might be geometrical order. This, these are rocks in a, a river where water erosion has produced this remarkable effect. You know, the, the rocks aren't shaped like that because of some structure of the rocks. It's an inter, there's nothing in the rocks that represents those, that structure. That's only an interaction between the rocks and the water and the water doing something to the rocks, and the rocks in turn doing something to the water. Mm -hmm. So the rocks themselves don't have that structure at all. Another example might be an ant column, where column organization is nowhere to be found in the behavior of individual ants. You know, you, you don't see ants doing that. You can't predict it, and yet a column, a new system, emerges that didn't exist before. Or in art, in the work of Bridget Riley, where simp the procedure of she follows a line down a page, and it produces through the natural free play of this activity something that's not in any of its components. Or Google's Deep Dream that uses iterated pattern searching and generation al algorithms and matches parts to holes and crosses levels of hierarchy, and new levels of significance emerge. Or um, evolution, natural selection, uh, in nature itself can be considered an emergent property, something that comes out of basic chemical or biological processes. 
And there are multiple levels of hierarchy in these systems. Um, other properties in nature themselves are the emergent features of evolution. So this property that came out in turn feeds back into the system. So there are numerous behaviors in nature whose explanations have been sought in emergence, like cooperative behavior, which is hard to explain sometimes. Why is there cooperation within or even between species when it would seem that uh, at the level of individuals there's no such benefit? Um, so this graph is from a Python library, Axelrod, and it shows the successes over time of uh, different strategies in um, a tournament of the iterated prisoner's dilemma, which was set up as um, a search for the secret of cooperation in evolution, first by um, uh, Robert Axelrod, who was a political scientist in the 1980. Um, in the first tournament, selfish strategies did poorly. You know the prison, I don't have time to explain the prisoner's dilemma, but I think probably most pr programmers are aware, look up the prisoner's dilemma. Um, selfish strategies did poorly. And uh, last year, my friend Vincent Knight at Cardiff University implemented this as a Python library. Um, it's, you, you can play, you can develop your own strategy and, and put it into the tournament. Um, it's been wildly successful and has reignited um, uh, interest in, in Axelrod and the, and the prisoner's dilemma. Very interesting. So have a look at uh, Axelrod. So those are all examples of emergent properties of different kinds. Not all of them have anything to do with consciousness, of course. But Hofstadter argues that Consciousness, intelligence, is an emergent property that arises from um, systems in the brain. And we discuss loops, first of all, and the magic that seems to follow when loops become self-referential and something new springs out of them. And then Hofstad is also interested in hierarchy so that we have loops within loops and loops at different levels in the system. And his thesis is that hierarchies of self-reflecting or self-similar loops that repeat themselves at different levels lie at the heart of cognition and consciousness. That the brain's um, neurological processes are themselves based on loops and self-reference and logic and play. Consciousness says it is an emergent property. It doesn't exist in the neurons of the brain. You know, if you're intelligent, it's not because you have really intelligent neurons. Yeah. Um, you won't find intelligence or consciousness by looking into the brain and looking more closely at its neurons. If we're going to find something there, it will be by studying the system, what happens in and to and between its loops. So this, you know, here we are, we've got the, this is, the, again, this is the impossible magic where something emerges, reflects on itself, feeds back into itself, crossing these levels of hierarchy. Hofstadter thinks that, or argues that this is the origin of consciousness, that self-referring hierarchies of loops uh, lie at the secret of thinking, of cognition in these merely physical processes in which absolutely no consciousness resides because they're merely physical processes. Consciousness belongs at a different dimension. So could consciousness be a system that nourishes itself like the snake eating its tail? Apparently, impossibly. Um, and Hofstadter thinks so. In fact, one of his later books is called I Am a Strange Loop and the I of our consciousness of subjectivity is this process of looping and self-referring across hierarchies. So now we're talking about intelligence and programming in a very different way from the one that followed uh, Turing. We're talking way in ways that I think do make it possible to ask meaningful questions about whether machines could think. And it raises the possibility of an approach into cognition research and artificial artificial intelligence that's quite unlike some of the ones we see at the moment that are premised maybe on uh, big data and huge ontologies and uh, 
brute force is unkind, but I'm an unkind person, you know, on, on vast computing power. Uh, and instead, we begin with the simplest of things, like the simplest concepts and tools that we as programmers uh, uh, enjoy playing with. Play itself, we enjoy playing with play, with rules, with poesis, with analogy making, with processes. So this approach comes into the question of consciousness, of intelligence, as poesis, as a process that's, that is at the same time transformative, that brings forth something new out of the world or into the world. And I think it's very intellectually compelling. And I think at the same time, however, philosophically profound it might be, the opportunities for exploring it are right at the hand of even the most novice Python programmer, which is also a fascinating uh, uh, thing. And it gives us a way into this quest that seems very rich and valuable and illuminating and rich for, it, rich for exploration, especially by us, by programmers. But it's more than that, because I think it does something even more important, it gives us a way to look for not just an insight into artificial intelligence, but just into intelligence itself. And I think the kind of post-Turing way of doing this doesn't give us any of those insights. Um, you know, I don't think that um, Microsoft, you know, Mike Tay, the Microsoft Hitler-loving Hitler -loving sex maniac chat bot on Twitter. That, I don't think that tells us anything about the nature of intelligence, however clever it might be. And the question of whether Hofstadter in the end is, is right or wrong, I don't think, right or wrong, I don't think is that important. It doesn't matter whether he's on the right track about the nature of consciousness and cognition. Um, his ideas are so beautiful and powerful and compelling that we should wrestle with them anyway, I think. Um, certainly more elegant than uh, or Siri or um, all these other things that people are doing very clever things with. Um, and I, my background's not in programming but in philosophy. I've been wrestling with Hofstadter and these ideas for 25 years, so a long time. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful, uh, it delights me that I'm happy to, it delights me that I'm able to be in the company of programmers who find this stuff by their, because they've got the right souls, they find this stuff so fascinating immediately. Um, and are also, find, are also fascinated by the poets and writers and artists that fascinate me. And these things that um, I found in programming, in a way, it's come back in a circle for me because uh, it's another pleasing circle of something going back to the beginning, these philosophical questions uh, that have been with me for decades. So um, it's like a, a snake eating its tail again. Um, there are some references uh, uh, for you if you want to uh, follow up any of these things. Uh, I've got my Douglas Hofstadter in that bag. It's, it's just falling apart. Um, it's been with me for a, a, a long time and I'm very grateful to Douglas Hofstadter. Um, so I haven't really, um, I haven't really taken you anywhere. Um, but I hope I've given you something to think about and I hope that somebody will come up to me who's a better programmer and um, give me some better code that I can maybe develop this talk into something that does a bit more Python and a, and a little less talking. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time for a few questions, have we? Yeah, thank you. So, um, I should say, um, a colleague of mine had to, wasn't able to come, so I'm doing a, another talk in case you didn't get sick of hearing me already on Thursday on documentation driven development. So, uh, please, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to talk to you now or, or, or later. All right, that's good. Let's go here. Uh, so, uh, I heard some critique of like this sort of big data approach to um, building intelligent systems and perhaps you can say that they, you cannot really call them fully intelligent in the moment. Uh, but imagine they, they succeeded and they, made, uh, and they made like a talking and thinking robot that you can have a conversation with. Uh, 
I guess you would still say that this is just a simulation of intelligence. So I wonder in your view, what is the difference between a real intelligence and a simulated intelligence? And, well, if Hofstadter is right, we could have an artificial intelligence. And I'm not sure that he is right, but I'd be much more prepared to admit of a Hofstadter-like in artificial intelligence than one that is based on, you know, this, as you say, the, the, the brute force, big data, mining, and uh, machine learning. Because I don't think a simulation is good enough. Something that's artificial is different from something that's a simulation. Just because something art is artificial doesn't mean it's not real. Yeah, it just means that it's been made. Um, so we could have a real intelligence, a real intelligence that's artificial, but a real intelligent intelligence that's simulated. It sounds like a contradiction in terms of it's merely a simulation. However good it gets. Because what's going on in, I, I think the question of what's going on inside actually does matter. I, I, did that answer your question or? Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is Turing's argument. I, it just seems unsatisfactory to me. I, I, we do care what's inside. Are there any questions? Yeah. One could take uh, even uh, uh, a more recursive point of view about that, that question. That is, um, we, we saw the, uh, the Spanish lesson. Uh, the Spanish lesson basically uh, points to the, the idea of uh, uh, an infinite string of uh, uh, Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. You, you, you get what I mean. The, the thing is that you get uh, that. Uh, that concept exists linguistically, still uh, is infinite. Is not is like uh, the uh, the fixed point of an infinite uh, sequence. Uh, so we, through language, we, we can uh, we can even represent that sort of thing, fixed points of infinite sequences. That sort of thing sometimes don't exist. So we we have signifiers. Without, without signified, and the thing is that intelligence itself may be something with, without a signified. Also, the you know the first Spanish lesson, I'm afraid, is a bit of a trick because it, it's not just folding up entirely by itself. There's actually the director, the artist, who makes it go in the right directions. It's not simply putting ese español at the beginning of. Uh, everything, it's choosing the right things and it's, it's playing with them. For example, the fact that some things are homophones in that, that you know, that the same sounds can be rendered differently so it can keep asking the question. So it, it would actually be an less interesting if it weren't directed. So there is some energy going into that system from outside. And that I think is, if there's something wrong with Hofstadter, that's probably where it lies. Uh, okay, yeah, we have time for one more okay. question. Hello, and good talk. Um, do you think that maybe neural nets combine the two approaches to artificial intelligence, as in neural nets have maybe this emergent feature to them, which might be described as emergent yes. conscience? Yes, I mean, th that seems to be very promising and interesting because they, uh, one of the things that we've learned from neural net networks is that they sometimes do unexpected things. And uh, not just unexpected things that it was left instead of right, but new orders of things sometimes, where a neural network will have an answer or have a response that seems to have stepped out and be looking at the thing from a different level. So, 
that might be a very, uh, I don't know, know enough about neural networks actually to say anything that useful, but what I've understood is that actually that is a promising possibility. That is the kind of thing. For, for a, I think that might just be the start of the kind of thing, and that we'll find more surprising things still. I'm sure we could take more questions offline, but uh, I have to cut you off here. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank again. you very much.